Thanks, Kate. So I wanted to start off, since this is the Reberg lecture, I was trying to think, you know, what are my connections to Bill? Because I've known Bill for a number of years. And probably the most direct connection I have to Bill is through one of Bill's students, Dave Glover. Uh, Dave was a postdoc at Hui. He had come from University of Alaska, where Bill was at, at the time. And Dave was one of my early mentors, so much so that we've remained colleagues for much of our life. And one of the things I, I think I have to thank Bill is Dave loves numerical methods. He loves to think about math and math and geosciences. And perhaps because of Bill's tutoring, um, Dave ended up writing a textbook, which I was fortunate to co-author with Dave. And so somehow the pain of writing this textbook, I can blame, blame on you, Bill. <laughs> so my talk today, I was asked to look forward a decade or two, and how are we going to be doing our science in 2030, 2040? What are the science questions? Uh, what are the, how are we going to be doing it? How are we going to be performing and acting as a community? And I'm going to look at it from the perspective of an oceanographer and an ocean biogeochemist. Uh, but many of the lessons I'm going to talk about are translatable to other parts of the Earth system. And for those who aren't oceanographers or marine related, I put up a cartoon here that sort of describes the main processes that I've been interested in for many years. And so if you look at the cartoon, you have carbon dioxide going into the ocean because of ocean biology. Phytoplankton grow, they take carbon out of the water, that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That carbon and that energy from photosynthesis and the phytoplankton then gets cycled through the marine, the marine food web. Some of that carbon gets respired and released back to the atmosphere, but a lot of that carbon sinks into the deep sea and acts as a sequestration, a sink for carbon that traps it away from the atmosphere. And one of the big questions in oceanography is, how big is that sink? How sensitive is it to changes in ocean circulation, changes in the biology? Now, of course, carbon dioxide also has physical attributes. So carbon dioxide can be sucked up from the atmosphere into seawater itself. The seawater is very good at removing carbon dioxide from the air. So in addition to this biological component, there's also a physical component. So for me, this is a really fascinating problem because it combines physics, chemistry, biology, all working together to lead to this the working of the large-scale ocean carbon cycle. So looking to the future, I wanted to start by looking to the past. Some of you, if you have a marine background, might be familiar with this book, Tracers of the Sea. It was written roughly about 40 years ago, so about twice what the time horizon that I was asked to look, look to. And so it's where were we 35, 40 years ago? And so Wally Broker, who passed away relatively recently, wrote this very seminal textbook. And it was based in large part on a global survey called GSX that had for the first time mapped the large scale distributions of not only nutrients, but car the carbon system, trace elements, radioisotopes around the globe. And from that, he was able to deduce a tremendous amount about the cycling and working of the ocean. But it used relatively simple physics, simple biology. I mean, I was raised as a chemist. Phytoplankton were sort of a little black box. Carbon went in, carbon went out, but you didn't worry too much about what the organism actually was doing. Similarly with physics, water mixed from the surface of the ocean to the deep ocean, but we didn't worry about physical dynamics and things like that. We used tracers to sort of constrain these large scale processes. So that's where we've started about 40 years ago. I'm gonna give you a sense of where we are today and then how that will lead into where we might be 10, 20 years in the future. So one of the points I, I want to make in this talk is that right now we've invested a huge amount of effort thinking about the ocean in terms of the global carbon cycle, the global climate cycle, and primarily from a scientific perspective. And that's crucial, but I think we need to also start to move that emphasis on thinking about the science and the climate cycle to things that are more relevant to day-to-day -day activities of people. And so this is a diagram that Gordon Bonin and I put together. Uh, we did one for the ocean and one for the land um, with the argument that we're starting down in the blue here 
um, in the bottom right corner, things like the carbon cycle and how that, how that develops with time. And then, but what is more relevant for many people are things like impacts on fisheries, things like the health of the ocean, harmful algal blooms, things that actually directly affect economic activity, people's health. And so we need to migrate our capability for not only models, but also observations from this corner down here, up here. And I'm gonna use through this talk a single example, which is ocean carbon uptake that's an important part of the climate system, but is also relevant to ocean acidification. As the ocean takes up carbon dioxide, it actually changes the seawater of chemistry. It makes it, the water more acidic, and that can have profound impacts on a whole range of marine species, like clams and mussels, corals, lots of different types of organisms that build skeletons or shells out of calcium carbonate are sensitive to ocean acidification. And I'm gonna use this as an example of how we can go from sort of basic science and climate science and project that into science that's more relevant to societal needs and also deals more with impacts and vulnerabilities of marine ecosystems. Another difference from when Wally wrote his textbook is the fact that we're now seeing and experiences already a large scale change in our global climate. Um, this is just showing the, the, the data is shown in the background here in gray. These are the long-term data record for global temperature overlaying with model projections of the human contribution. And what you see is that about the mid 20th century, we really saw an uptick in the rate of global warming. This is attributed almost entirely to human activity and that almost inevitably because of inertia in the physical climate system and our social economic system, this warming is gonna continue for at least another decade, two decades, three decades. Even with very aggressive climate mitigation policies that try to limit emissions, we're on a trajectory where we're gonna see substantial amount more warming over the next few decades. So if we're thinking about what our science is gonna look like, it's gonna be overlaying almost everything we do with this pressure. And then there's lots of other pressures affecting the ocean, overfishing, habitat destruction, particularly of valuable coastal uh, wetlands, coral reefs. So this human presence where, you know, if you looked at Wally's book in the GSX days, they were out, you know, there might be human induced tracers, um, that were used to study the large scale ocean circulation, but we didn't think that the ocean ecosystem or biogeochemical cycling had been largely affected. Now it's likely that almost everything we look at has some imprint of human activity. The other difference from Wally's era is that we're not just going out on ships. I love research ships. I spent a lot of my graduate and early career going out on ships, but ships are slow, they're very expensive. Uh, one of my friends likes to say that a research ship moves at the speed of a 10-speed bicycle. You know, imagine trying to do the whole Atlantic on a 10-speed bicycle. Um, but the advantage we have now is we have rapid technological advances in sampling of the ocean, both new sensor technologies that can deploy, be deployed in the ocean, and robotic platforms, gliders, um, profiling floats that we can deploy out in the ocean and allow them to collect data. The other thing is we've had rapid advances in our computational environment, our ability to build models, uh, both prognostic models, but also database and statistical models. I don't really like the term big data, um, but that's where we're headed is large volumes of data that we're going to analyze statistically. And I think in oceanography, we're headed to a point where not everyone's going to be producing data. When I was a graduate student, you know, the, the goal was to go build a method, go to sea, collect samples, make measurements. You were the person who produced that data. We're headed to an era where more and more of the data is gonna be generated either out of large scale observing networks or out of some blend of observations and, mo and models and more and more of us are going to be data users and we have to be savvy data users, but not the original data producers. So that's sort of the background of where I'm headed. I'm gonna now go into a little bit more on the ocean carbon cycle 
and work my way through that example, starting from the climate system and the sort of traditional um, scientific rationale for why we're interested in the ocean carbon cycle, and then work my way back up the chain towards um, these vulnerabilities, these eco ecosystem impacts associated with ocean acidification. So most of you are probably familiar with this curve. This is the atmospheric CO2 curve from Mauna Loa, started by Dave Keeling in the late 1950s. The red line shows the large increase in atmospheric CO2 driven primarily by fossil fuel use over the last few decades, but earlier on in the century, there was also a large contribution from deforestation and agricultural practices. The red line down here at the bottom, this is the pre-industrial level based on, um, based on ice core measurements, so a pre-instrumental record. We have a pretty good handle now on the sources and sinks of carbon, though of course I was talking to Jim Randerson today and he, you know, there are still many questions about the exact details. But I'm gonna go with, you know, Jim, just hold, hold off your questions. We'll, I'll go through that. This is a, a pretty good estimate. So the bar chart here, these are the cumulative emissions. So the gray here are fossil fuel emissions. So coal, natural gas, oil. The orange here, those are the deforestation land use emissions. We don't know those nearly as well. There's some error bars on here if, you can, if you're close enough to the screen. The green is the estimate of the land uptake. And what I'm interested in is this, this sort of aqua green here, which is the ocean uptake. And depending on how you want to count the land, um, it's roughly a quarter to a third of human emissions has ended up in the ocean. And we think that this uptake is primarily driven by physical dissolution of carbon dioxide. It's a gas. It dissolves into the surface ocean. Uh, because the ocean is alkaline, it's actually very good at sucking up CO2, much better than fresh water alone. And this sink is what's changing the chemistry of the ocean. Now, the good news is without this sink, atmospheric carbon dioxide would be much higher. So the ocean has provided a very valuable surface by service by removing this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And a tremendous amount of effort over the last several decades has been devoted to trying to quantify this ocean sink. So one of the ways, um, there's several different ways that the sink is being quantified. Some is ocean data, and I'll give some examples. Some are numerical models, and some is actually using atmospheric data to constrain the partitioning between the sinks that go into the land and go into the ocean. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the primary ocean data that has been used to develop estimates of these, the long-term sink of ocean carbon. The first way is to think about the fluxes of between the atmosphere and the ocean. So there has to be some thermodynamic driving force to move carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to the ocean. As atmosphere concentrations of carbon dioxide rise, it increases that thermodynamic driving force. So if we could measure fluxes everywhere around the globe, we could sum them up and look at the net, and that would be the sink into the, the net sink into the ocean. Now, of course, the ocean has a large carbon cycle dynamic of its own. Biology is taking up carbon in one place. It's being released somewhere else. Water's being moved around. So it's not a simple pattern. The other problem is we don't have always enough data. So I'm showing on the left here, these are just the, all the measurements that are available internationally for this, the amount of the uh, carbon dioxide in the surface ocean. And the color coding is the, the value. So for example, you see down here, large red values here are high values. This is the equatorial upwelling that brings old water that has a lot of carbon dioxide in it up to the surface that ventilates to the atmosphere. That's part of this natural background associated with photosynthesis and carbon production the sinking flux of carbon, that carbon eventually gets brought back to the surface. The equatorial Pacific is one of those places. So you need to basically subtract off these large scale natural, natural patterns in order to get to the anthropogenic or human perturbation. The other thing you see on here is these are roughly decades. There really wasn't much data 
in the 50s, 60s, 70s, more in the 80s, and then from the 1990s and forward, there's a fairly substantial amount of data. A lot of this is based on research ships, measurements on research ships, but also commercial vessels, cargo vessels, that are instrumented by scientific teams and that collect data as they're going back and forth on their traditional cargo routes. And so what you see is that a lot of the data is centered in the North Pacific, in the North Atlantic, traditional large transportation routes, and there's large parts of the ocean where we have very little data, even with very substantial efforts to collect these observations. So even with you know, an order of magnitude increase in the amount of data, we still have big holes. And so in order to build a global map, people have to take this data, use some form of statistical modeling to be able to fill in and interpolate. And a lot of these approaches use some form of machine learning. Um, I'm just, the map I'm showing here is a neural net-based net approach. Um, so there's a substantial amount of statistical analysis that goes into this. Another approach would be to build a prognostic model and actually try to bring together these observations with the prognostic model. And in a relatively new set of developments, there's a number of groups around the, around the world who are, who are doing this model data fusion, sometimes called data assimilation. People use different mathematical techniques. But rather than just relying on statistical approaches, here we're trying to use um, the actual dynamics of ocean physics and ocean biogeochemistry, and then use the data to nudge the model in a way that's dynamically consistent with both what we know about how the ocean functions, but also the observations. And I'm just showing here on the left is an observational product, the same one I was showing before. Uh, and then on the right is the assimilation product. And you see substantial differences that right now the, the dynamics in the models are inconsistent with the observational products. Now, perhaps that's something wrong with these observational products uh, because they, there's not enough data. Maybe there's data limitations. Uh, the Southern Ocean, I actually work out on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is why I chose this one. People don't go there during the winter very much. So there's large data gaps, particularly during the winter. But we're at that stage where we're trying to blend observations and models. Another approach, rather than looking at the surface of the ocean, might be to look uh, in, the, in depth in the ocean, right? So if there's a net flux of carbon into the ocean, it's got to be stored somewhere. Wally Broker used to be, his joke was, you know, show me the dead body, show me the dead carbon. This is fossil fuel carbon. If it's building up in the ocean, we should be able to detect it. Now, of course, we didn't have samples from the 50s or the 40s to have a nice baseline. But starting in the 1980s, we started to have some global surveys. And I'm just showing over here, this is, is sort of some of these global survey lines. Um, I actually spent quite a bit of my life on the one going from Iceland into the South Atlantic. They're very laborious cruises because you have to collect you know, routine water samples every 50 kilometers or so going all the way up and down uh, throughout the entire basin. But we now have repeat measurements over time. And uh, the, color bar, the color picture here is showing a reconstruction that Nikki Gruber and colleagues just published a couple months ago for what they think is the buildup of anthropogenic carbon over time from the survey in the 80s and 90s to the most recent survey. So these would be quasi-direct measurements of the change in carbon. And so what we would hope is that our estimates of the flux of carbon into the ocean balance this buildup that we see in the interior, and to first order, they do. So this is a, a substantial success, but we can only repeat this global, this global pattern here about once a decade. That's the amount of resources that is available to do that. So if we want to move forward, better understand this, better track this, we need to other technologies than just going to sea on ships. One of the really fascinating opportunities is to use robotic instruments called Argo floats. These are profiling floats. Um, you deploy them in the ocean. They spend a few years, um, up, up to five to seven years if the battery life is good. 
they make measurements um, over time. So the, the north-south section here, this was a ship survey where they were measuring, in this case, ocean pH, a measure of ocean acidification. And then they would throw off one of these floats. And then this is now a time series. So this, is, this took about a, a month and a half to do this cruise. They'd throw over these robotic floats. And once the ship is gone, the robotic floats continue to make measurements over time. They radio their data back via satellite. And you're getting real-time updates on the change in ocean chemistry. So right now, there's roughly 4,000 of these Argo floats deployed globally. Um, it's an international effort. Only a small fraction of them have biogeochemical instruments on them. Most of them are just measuring uh, f simple physical properties like temperature and salinity. But there's a large effort to start upgrading these floats. So on the sort of decadal time horizon, I think it will be very routine to be able to sit down in the morning and see the global update of what is ocean biogeochemistry doing, at least for the properties that we can measure on these floats. Another very fascinating technology that has become available uh, recently is we be able to make measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide from space. There's been an extensive effort to measure atmospheric carbon dioxide from uh, land-based surface stations and also airborne campaigns, but the coverage can be relatively limited. Uh, there's now um, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory and the, uh, two, which is flying as a satellite. They just launched the Orbiting Carbon Observatory three, which will be on the space station that just went up last week. Uh, and these make column measurements of atmospheric CO2. There's still a lot of challenges to the, this technology, but I think it's gonna become more routine and I'm just showing here some work from JPL. This is a time series across the equatorial Pacific at the start of an El Nino event. So remember, the, the uh, equatorial Pacific is normally a large source of carbon to the atmosphere because you're upwelling this carbon-rich water from below. At the beginning of the El Nino, you saw a drop in the amount of carbon dioxide over the equatorial Pacific. The ocean upwelling had slowed down. You had less carbon getting into the atmosphere. But then later on during the El Nino, terrestrial effects started to kick in, and atmospheric carbon dioxide started to go up. And so I think one of the challenges and opportunities is to reconcile what we think is going on with the, in the ocean versus what's going on in the atmosphere and combining these satellite data sets with ocean observations. So, that's where we are now, but what about projecting into the future? So to project into the future, we're gonna to have to use some form of numerical models. Um, Keith Morris, I see sitting in the audience, he and I and others have spent a lot of our time, and, and Jim, working on one particular Earth system model, the community Earth system model. And there was a really nice uh, study recently led by Nikki Lewandowski, who's at the University of Colorado, where, which I thought highlighted both the challenges and, 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 um, and opportunities for using these kind of models. So here we are in 2020. I put a, a little gray bar for the sort of 20 to 30 to 2040 horizon. And then these are the blue and the red lines are two sets of experiments with the same model, but they ran them with different human forcing. So if you look out long time scale, 30, 40, 50 years, the biggest uncertainty associated with the global carbon cycle and, and indeed the, the global climate system is what are humans gonna do? What are gonna be the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases like methane? Um, but in this sort of intermediate time period, what you see is that there's not that much difference in ocean uptake between these two scenarios. It really starts to appear later in the century. This goes back to that inertia of the social economic system that controls carbon emissions. Now, these aren't single lines. They're actually, if you're close enough to see, they're actually a little fuzzy. So rather than run one model simulation, they ran a whole ensemble of model simulations. These Earth system models have their own natural internal variability. They develop their own El Nino cycles. Um, there's large scale sort of 
interannual to decadal climate variability within these model simulations. And so that's why these lines have a bit of a fuzz. And so if you break down the uncertainty sources here, you see that the, the red is the internal variability. So if you were trying to think about predictability on sort of a few years ahead of time, it's that internal variability, that natural internal dynamic of the climate system that's your larger source of error. As you move forward, sort of out to the 2030 period, this internal variability has mostly died off, and the biggest is the scenario, whether you're on the blue line or the red line. It's your biggest source of variability. Now, this is within one model. We would like to claim that the community or system model is the best model, um, but you want to look at other models as well. And so they also looked at a whole collection of models. So now each one of these, um, the cloud like of red lines, these are different scenarios. So the color bars are still, or the color are still different scenarios, but the different lines are now different models, different interpretations of how we think the Earth system is gonna work. And interestingly, for this sort of 2030 to 2040 period, this difference between model or model error is one of the dominant factors. The scenarios are still important, the internal village internal variability is small, but it's really this model variability which is contributing substantially, which says that we don't know enough about the natural system. Um, if we did, then everyone's models would agree. So what are some of the sources of that, that model variability? So I'm just showing this is a, a very simple exercise where people run, this, run their different models with the same pathway trajectory of atmospheric CO2, and all of them say that the ocean's going to take up carbon. All of the, the cumulative carbon goes up in all cases, but there's a range of variation. And these are done without any climate effects. So these are just looking at the ability of these ocean models to take up carbon dioxide. And what we think of is the largest uncertainty, at least for the ocean models, is not the chemistry or the biogeochemistry, but it's actually just the physics. It's the physical transport of carbon that's come in from the atmosphere into the ocean interior because that's a rate limiting step, how quickly water gets from the surface of the ocean to the subsurface. So I like this cartoon. This is a cartoon that Matt Long put together a few years ago. Um, and one of the, the um, I wouldn't call it a secret, but one of the aspects of these models that's not well discussed is that physical transport in these large ocean models, um, we don't resolve all the processes that are important. In particular, turbulent processes associated with large, um, we call them mesoscale eddies, but you can think of them as basically ocean storms internal to the ocean are, are very important. And so too are very small scale turbulent processes associated with mixing. The ocean tends to be stratified, so you have light water over heavy water, and how quickly that light and, de and, and dense water mix with each other. Very small sort of centimeter scale to meter scale processes is not resolved in the models. And these unresolved turbulent processes are the biggest difference between these models that then have big impacts on ocean carbon uptake. So, Computers are getting faster. Maybe scientists are getting a little brighter. Um, this is, I'm just showing one of the, the NCAR simulation results where we're now able to run these high resolution models that actually start to capture some of the turbulence processes. So you see the, the little whirls down here. These are these storms that are having impacts not only on the physics, but on the biogeochemistry. And sort of on the 10 year to 20 year time scale, these are going to become much more accessible. So at least some of these physical processes associated with turbulence will actually be able to resolve in our models rather than parameterize. And we know these parameterizations are fraught with problems. So the other source of uncertainty is the actual response of the model to climate change. So this is not only uh, climate change on the physics, but climate change on the biology. You'll notice that these tend to go down now. Before we were looking at CO2 was going up, ocean carbon uptake, or ocean carbon storage was going up. 
Uh, climate will tend to, in all, at least all the models that I've seen, will reduce the ability of the ocean to take up carbon. One way it does that is the ocean becomes more stratified, so it's harder to get water from the surface where it's been loaded with anthropogenic carbon into the ocean interior. There's a range here, and part of that range is ocean physics issues, but part of it is how the biogeochemistry is gonna respond. That natural background where phytoplankton are taking up carbon in the surface ocean and some of that carbon is moving down at depth. Now, one of the positives is that there's been a considerable amount of work recently. Uh, this is a schematic from the NASA Exports program, which has been at sea just recently, trying to look at how organic carbon gets from the surface ocean into the deep water. Uh, we have a lot of data on the surface ocean. We have some data from the bottom of the ocean. But there was sort of this interior, we call it the twilight zone, or the mesopelagic ocean from about 100 meters down to about 1,000 meters, that's very biologically active, very crucial to the carbon cycle, very hard to measure but combination of shipboard measurements and new robotic measurements are opening that up. And also new chemical and biological measurements, particularly uh, approaches for using genomics and other molecular techniques are providing a, a, a new window on that. A, a, another aspect that we didn't have, thinking back to Wally Broker's book, Tracers in the Sea, we didn't have routine measurements of ocean biological processes from space. It was only late, late mid-1997 where we flew the first routine ocean color sensor that was providing near continuous measurements of ocean biology. So these are sensors that can be used to estimate the amount of chlorophyll in the surface ocean, which is a proxy for the amount of phytoplankton and also the amount of photosynthesis. So you're seeing here, this is a long-term climatology, the blue are regions of very low uh, background levels of phytoplankton, and then going into the greens and reds. It's strongly structured by large-scale ocean circulation, so places where you have upwelling, such as the equatorial Pacific, are also places of active biology because that water that comes up from below is loaded with nutrients, uh, trace metals, trace elements that are needed by the phytoplankton. Looking to the future, uh, right now, ocean color, we only look at a small number of, of wavelengths of light. Um, but if everything goes well, within a few years, um, hyperspectral satellites will be flown that will allow us not only to look at how much chlorophyll there is, but perhaps be able to differentiate between some different types of phytoplankton that have different absorption spectrums in the visible. Uh, we are also starting to use profiling LIDARs. So these are instruments that give us a measure of how much biomass is in the water column and its vertical structure. So there's a satellite revolution that's on its way that will help us better understand ocean biogeochemistry. And then models of various sorts, uh, models that actually try to distinguish between different types of plankton and how they're interacting trophically and then also models that look at, uh, at the cellular level, at cell physiology, cell composition, cell stoichiometry of different elements. So I think there's a lot of uh, promise in being able to integrate these new observations with new, uh, with, with new modeling techniques. So where are we based on the models that we have today? Well, we think that the, water's, the ocean's gonna get warmer particularly in the surface, it's gonna become more acidified. So this is the drop in pH over here. Um, I haven't talked too much, but that warmer ocean, more stratified ocean is gonna hold less oxygen, which has a profound impact on many types of marine life. And then finally, we're gonna see large scale shifts in the amount of photosynthesis. Uh, not only the, the global amount of photosynthesis in the ocean, but the regional patterns. I'm gonna focus a little bit on the pH in the last um, little bit of time I have left. So I had mentioned that carbon dioxide gets sucked up in the ocean. When carbon dioxide gets in water, it actually reacts with water um, to form bicarbonate ion and it actually loses a proton. So this is what makes the water more acidic when you add carbon dioxide. So this is like taking you know, in a club soda, you've bubbled CO2 in, it makes it a little bit more acidic. 
Uh, but importantly for the ocean, that proton doesn't always just hang out there. It gets consumed in a secondary reaction with carbonate ions. So I, already too much chemistry, I, I know. But so this carbonate ion is important because if you think about corals or many shellfish, they make shells and, and skeletons out of calcium carbonate. And as you make the water more acidic and reduce this carbonate ion, this carbonate ion is being consumed, you actually make it harder for these organisms to grow their shells. So this is just showing the time series. The red is that Hawaii time series I showed before, that atmospheric CO2 is going up. The blue is showing that surface ocean CO2, it's considerably noisier, um, but on the long time scale, it is going up as well. Um, pH is going down and carbonate ion is going down. So what does that mean, mean for many types of marine life? So this is a nice synthesis that Christy Croker has put together. She's up at UC Santa Cruz right now. Um, for many different types of organisms, different experiments have been done looking at the effects of CO2. So for example, calcareous algae or corals, coccolithophores, which is a small type of plankton that makes calcium, shell, calcium carbonate uh, shell around itself, mollusks. For many of these organisms, making the water more acidic makes it harder for them to build their shells, to grow, and to thrive. And so this has primarily been done in the laboratory, but this is the kind of experiment that as you move to higher and higher CO2, starting from today's levels to what might be the end of the century, um, this is for a, a particular type of clam. The clam isn't able to grow as quickly. It grows a smaller shell, it grows a thinner shell, uh, and there's higher mortality in these juvenile stages. So what that, might that mean, not just for the ecosystem, but for people? So this is some work from Sarah Cooley, uh, who's now at Ocean Conservancy, and she <laughs> took the information we had on the biology combined it with the information on the biogeochemistry of how quickly the water was going to acidify, but then connected it to what we know about a major fishery on the East Coast. The US uh, scallop fishery in the Northeast is about a half billion dollar a year industry. Um, and she looked at not only how acidification might change the growth of these, but how it might affect harvest rates. And so without going into details of the model, um, she looked at demand for scallops and how that'll increase with time, and whether we can use management techniques to minimize the effect of acidification. And what she found is that to some extent, better management practices can partially offset the effects of acidification, but you reach a point somewhere around 2040 where better management no longer can help. And so then you're sort of on this spiral down where the fishery starts to decline, um, irrespective of the best management practices we can put into place. Uh, she and Jeremy Mathis did a really nice study taking what we know about the sensitivity of not only shellfish, but finfish, uh, and applied it to Alaska, and looked at the risk to coastal communities. So this is a combination of looking at how quickly will different waters around Alaska acidify? How dependent upon those communities are they for fishing? And then also, what's the adaptive capacity of those communities? What's their economic level? What's their education level? What other resources? If they can't fish for shellfish, could they switch to something else? And so thinking about the risks for the, the community, it's not just the biology, it's not just the biogeochemistry, it's the social economic condition of the communities their reliance on natural resources, and their ability to work around problems as they arise from climate change or acidification. I should say that the areas in red are some of the poorest areas in the state that have high reliance on fisheries, either for commercial fisheries or subsistence fisheries. And because of that, they're more vulnerable to ocean acidification. And then finally, I just want to wrap up here, and then we'll, I'll take some questions with uh, factor, factors that are beyond just rising atmospheric carbon dioxide and climate change. 
We also see substantial coastal acidification associated with local pollution sources. So when excess nutrients from fertilizers or from human sewage, uh, uh, from agricultural practices and animal husbandry, or fossil fuel use that releases nitrogen into the atmosphere, when that nitrogen gets into coastal waters, it leads to large algal blooms. When those blooms are consumed by microbes and die, um, it releases a lot of carbon into the water and can lead to acidification. So this is some work uh, that we've been doing locally in Woods Hole by Jenny Rubin, uh, looking at the link between eutrophication driven by nutrient pollution and, and acidification. They're biogeochemically connected. And this is across several different estuaries. The blue line here, the blue line is the uh, saturation state for calcium carbonate. So lower value is more acidified waters. And you see some of these estuaries are very acidified already. But what she did is calculate, well, if we were to reduce the nutrient pollution, could we actually improve the situation? And so the, the red line is if we were to actually meet the EPA mandated nutrient pollution standards, which would both improve the, you know, reduce the nutrient eutrophication, improve water quality, but it also, particularly for some of the, the estuaries on the far right, would actually substantially improve the acidification problem. And this is very important in many coastal regions, both on the west coast and east coast, because it impacts shellfish. So I'm just gonna wrap up here. This is my, my summary. So where are we gonna be in 10 to 20 years? Well, I think we're still gonna be working on some of those problems that Wally Broker outlined, but we're gonna be looking at it in new ways. We're gonna be thinking about it in the context of climate and human-driven pressures. We're gonna be looking not only at the basic science, but the impacts on human communities. So basically bridging from that, from basic research into socioeconomic coupled human natural systems. Um, the disciplinary boundaries, I've been talking a lot. I've sort of assumed, well, I'm gonna need some physics, some biology, some chemistry. The sort of traditional uh, disciplinary boundaries, at least in oceanography, are breaking down um, because we need all of those aspects to solve the problems that are on the, our, our plate right now. We're gonna be utilizing much more sophisticated observing networks and new robotic and satellite technologies to address these problems. And we're gonna be combining that with new approaches for statistical, uh, if you like, big data modeling and also prognostic modeling. So I'll stop there and take questions. Well, while Michael's coming up, I've got, I just have to. I, so I'm waiting for this one, Scott, it's not fair. Embarrassing picture of Michael, but I put up the embarrassing picture of me. So this was NASA guess. It was Tom's restaurant stays, yes. But you do have time for questions. I'll give you a warning. We have to be out here in 13 minutes because of another meeting. But we have 13 minutes for questions. So please raise your hand and get a microphone. So. Um, observation networks are hierarchical. So I think we're gonna continue using ships because there are certain measurements that you just need. You need physical water samples. You need to be able to make measurements quickly uh, on the ship. So I, I think ships will continue to play a, a role. Um, but what we'd like to do is leverage ships for where they're most valuable and use robots, cheap distributed sensors um, where we can. And really, you know, optimizing that is gonna be a challenge. I think there's gonna be a lot of stumbling on the way, but I, I don't see ships going away on a 10-year time frame. Um, in fact, we're building new ships. Um, you know, right, right now, NSF is investing a substantial amount in building ships because I think there's, that's the realization. Um, I, okay, so I think 
Uh, disciplinary silo is the wrong way to train, train students in our discipline. You know, that we really need to give them a, at least a solid core across physics, chemistry, biology, geology. I think students need stronger grounding in data analysis and, and modeling because they're gonna be more data users. Uh, even if you're a lab person or a field person, you're going to have this context of observations from satellites, models. Um, I'd say the other thing is spending more time thinking about how your science connects to society. I mean, I, I was trained at, at Woods Hole. You know, we were a blue water oceanography. Dealing with, you know, thinking about societal problems, that was for some applied, you know, small science institution down the street. That wasn't what we did. I, I just think that's the wrong way to go. Well, so, and, and, and I would overlay that it's, the, the ocean will take up less, but the climate effects are, are on top of the background uptake are a relatively small effect. Right. Um, often what you see, at least in the models, not true if it's, you know, not, not clear if it's true or not, it's a model, um, is that the biggest effect is as the circulation slows down, you don't bring as much carbon up from below. So the deep water is carbon rich. So you're bringing up this carbon, less of this carbon rich water, but you're also bringing up less of the nutrients. And so the physical and biology, see if I can flip through fast enough. I actually have a, uh, I have a second talk, I have a third talk. Um, uh, no, I took it out. Um, uh, the biology and the physics often are partially offset each other. So they're often um, working in opposite directions. So the climate effect of the biology is counteracting the climate effect of the physics. And this is where I think, you know, we have an opportunity uh, using observations and modeling to really resolve that. The one place where this is a little different is the Southern Ocean. Uh, where in the Southern Ocean, because of climate effects, you actually think that the upwelling might increase. And so contrasting the Southern Ocean with other parts of the globe, I think, is a really good experiment. Wow. I was going to say, I actually did, and, and, and Ellen might be chuckling, so I did my thesis on tritium and helium isotopes. So, and, and then I got into chlorofluorocarbons. So that was basically my, my thesis. Well, I, was, I was a tracer person. I wasn't, I only became a carbon person later in life. Um, yeah, I haven't thought, to, I mean, there's sort of a very standard suite of ocean um, tracers that are being used. Sulfur hexafluoride is a relatively new one that's been added um, that's been quite valuable. I, I don't immediately, I, I don't immediately have one. Um, the other one is that the radioisotopes, you know, and unfortunately, um, you know, I have a, a, a colleague at Woods Hole, Ken Bissler, who has done a tremendous job uh, using um, radioisotopes released from Fukushima to track physical and biological processes. And, you know, it's trying to get a little silver lining out of a terrible disaster. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, we were talking about this earlier today. Um, you know, there's strong evidence that large-scale temperature changes in the ocean are having a discernible impact, whether it's coral bleaching in the tropics or shifts in species ranges um, for many types of invertebrates and, and, and fish. Um, some of that is because we've been looking at those effects and we have data to document that. The commercial fish stocks go way back. Um, this multi-stressor problem is a really interesting one. For some organisms, acidification might be the dominant one. Um, uh, but I think for most of marine life in the open ocean, it's probably gonna be uh, temperature 
Um, for some fish species, the deoxygenation is going to shrink their vertical range. And then I think of acidification as sort of an add-on stressor that makes it harder to recover from those other ones. But, you know, you know I don't know. I, you know, the acidification, I, I don't want to be, I, I, acidification is one of, my, one of my main things, and I just try not to oversell it. Thank you very much. Let's thank Scott again.